been faithful. Many people have passed on. People better than us. But in his righteousness, he has preserved us. Because of his mercy, he has kept us. Can you say thank you, Father? Thank you, Lord, because I'm not in the prison right now. Thank you, Father, because I don't have a court case hanging over my head. Thank you, Father, because I have options. This morning, when you looked at your wardrobe as you tried to get dressed for church, you had options. They may not have been many, but they were there. A person who has two outfits does not have much of an option. You are either wearing one or you are about to wear the other. Thank you, Father, we can choose where to go. Thank you, Father, because we can choose who to associate with. Beyond that, thank you, Lord, because we are free to worship you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Father, for the liberty to worship you this morning. It's such a privilege. We're not stumbling out of a beer parlor. We're not st stumbling out of a strip club. But we are here in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We say thank you, Father. You are the good, good Father. You are the good, good God. And we come this morning to just say thank you. Thank you. Scripture says if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would have been utterly swallowed up. We would have been utterly destroyed. But God kept us. In spite of our mistakes, God keeps us. In spite of our disobedience, God is merciful towards us. Can we embrace the mercy of God this morning? The mercy that keeps us sane. People lose their minds every day. I see it every day at work. But God has kept us. We are not better than them. We are not more righteous than them. It's by grace we are kept. None of works so we can boast. Lord, we bless your name, O oh God. We say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, we ask that you glorify yourself in this house. That, Father, you speak the word and sees it to our hearts. The reason you brought us here this morning, let it be fully established. No one goes home the same way they came in Jesus' name. Father, our lives are transformed by your word. And I thank you because that word keeps us and preserves us. We give you praise, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I empty myself of every head knowledge. I ask that my heart would indict those matters. That my tongue would be like the pen of a ready writer. That I will speak only of my King, Jesus and all of myself. I ask that your people's hearts will be touched in the name of Jesus. And that Father, fruits will manifest. Positive fruits will manifest. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah! Shall we celebrate the Lord? Welcome to Lofty Heights. I want you to go around. You know how we do it. Go around, say hello to somebody. Comment the person. The person, how did your week go? I like your hair, I like your shoes, I love your dress. Hallelujah to Jesus! I celebrate you, you're in the best place ever. Hallelujah! Hallelujah to Jesus! Hallelujah to Jesus! Amen. Introduce yourself if it's somebody new. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma. We have some new, a new couple in our midst. We celebrate you. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Can we come back to our seats? Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Just before we sit, sorry. Um, this morning, we are still on the series. What's the name of the series? No, this is the other. Belong. Become, believe. <laughs> Belong, believe, become. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 God is good. Amen. 
We'll be taking our opening scripture from 2 Chronicles 2020. Second Chronicles 2020. Hallelujah. If you have the amplified version, I would appreciate that. It's always a good idea to at least have your Bible ready to be opened. Amen. 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 Hallelujah to Jesus. So shall we read? It's just one scripture. So we're going to read it together. Okay? We're not going to go the way we usually go, but we're going to read it all together. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we ready? Let's go together. One, two, three, go. They rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat and said, Hear me, O Judah, and O ye inhabitants. Jesus. We give you praise, Father. Come and do your thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have your seats in God's presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn to someone and say, I'm in, I'm in for a good time. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Now, this is a popular scripture that many of us have read and have seen over and over again. But we're going to look at it in the context of our day. Amen. If you want to give this um, message a subtitle, I want you to title it Receiving the Ministry of Church Leadership. Receiving the Ministry of Church Leadership. By church leadership, I mean the ministry of the settler and the ministry of your leaders in church. Hallelujah to Jesus. For a quick recap, especially for those of you who have not been following the series or this is your first experience with Lofty Heights, many things have been said and I'm just trying to summarize. First thing we learned is that church is not a building. The church is you and I. Amen. We also learned that life should not be done alone. Scripture says that God sets the solitary in families. What that means is that God is intentional that no one lives in isolation. Amen. So you have the church as a church family. For those of you that were here when Sister Sandra was praying, she kept saying, you came here to meet your siblings. Hallelujah. That's what the church is. It's a family. Amen. We are also taught about the benefits of a local assembly. The fact that it's a place where you belong. You belong first by the fact that Jesus died for you and you've accepted him. And also when you're part of a local assembly, you also belong to that local assembly. Amen. Some of the benefits that were listed were things like being trained, learning how to do things. Hallelujah. People have been in their place of work and because of how excellent they were in their performance, people were like, Did you go do you go to Lofty Heights? And when they say yes, they're like, oh, no wonder. Hallelujah. Now, that's just one example. A local assembly is a place where you learn how to relate with people, how to tolerate people. A person who has been in a church, for example, for one, two, three years, seeing all sorts of people is unlikely to have problems in the workplace. Because the variety in the workplace is not as much as that in the church. The church is full of all sorts of people, and that's what it's meant to be. Like the Ark of the Covenant, which was full of all sorts of animals, that's the way the church is supposed to be. Those that are angry, those that are hurt, those who are happy, those who are funny, those who don't laugh, those allergic to people, <laughs> hallelujah, that's what the church family looks like. So if we belong to that, we learn how to relate better. Amen. Having good relationships in church, we've learned about dealing with offenses. If you cannot be offended by a church member and you're still in that church faithful, believe me, it's so unlikely your spouse can offend you that much. Because you've learned how to be accommodating, you've learned how to accept 
weaknesses of others and to move ahead. Hallelujah. So this morning, as we go on in our series, Belong, Believe, Become, Becoming who or becoming what? What does God expect us to become or who does God expect us to become? He expects us to become what He wants us to be, not we, what we want to be. Many years ago, the Lord said to me, He said, Your service in my kingdom is not a popularity contest. Your focus is not on how many likes you have. Your focus is to please Him who has called you to be a soldier. Your focus is to be all that God wants you to be. Hallelujah. So becoming all you are sent to be, becoming a faithful church worker, becoming a more effective worker in, your, in the marketplace. I remember when I started serving many years ago back in school, back in university. And sometimes pastor would just randomly, my pastor there would just, at that time I felt it was random, he would just randomly assign something to, you know, I was in the dance team, I was the head of the dance team. He would just, you know, randomly assign, uh, assign something to us. He may call me and say, oh, Jimmy, your team will be ministering next Sunday. And I'm like, we're not on the roster. I had a team of 44 people. How do you get 44 people together to put together a dance and we start the next Sunday? But God helped. Now, going forward, when I graduated from the university and um, I had a boss, a very thorough and tough, but lovely boss. <laughs> Sometimes she just, she has a presentation to do at a conference. I'm talking about an international conference. And maybe she's preparing for it, she's prepared for it. I know nothing about it. And I just get a message. Jumoke, how are you? I can't make this conference you will be presenting. Like, really? Sometimes I just, the first time she sent it, I sent her a message to say, Ma, I think you sent it to the wrong person. <laughs> but you know what? Because I had learned how to perform under pressure, even in church, it was easy to just flow in it. Those are the things that the church is meant to do. It also helps us in becoming a role model to others. Um, this was many years ago, 1998. My best friend back then was the head of the intercessory team. And um, we used to pray together a lot, a lot, and you know. Um, I had a medical condition at that time, something to do with my tummy. And at that time, it was hard to fast. So I would, sometimes I'm fasting, I'll be in a lot of pain. Even when I'm not fasting, I'm in a lot of pain. So I was like, what's the big deal? Fast, be fast. Amen. <laughs> so I didn't know that sometimes, even though she didn't have a medical condition, she's a human being. Sometimes it was tough. So one day she looked at me and said, Jimmy, I never told you this. But each time you're able to fast and pull through a fast that you decided to go on, he said, I'm encouraged. When I'm tired, I tell myself, Jimmy has a medical condition. She still pulls through. Why can't I pull through? I was shocked. I didn't know that from something so ugly, God can bring out something so beautiful. So when she said, I was like, really? She was like, yeah, she said, you, you're a big encouragement to me. All I was doing was just doing my thing. So that's what happens in a church family. You meet other people who encourage you, who challenge you. They may not walk up to you and say, I challenge you this day. No, but by the things they do, by their consistently, consistency, they challenge and they encourage you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. Today I'll be focusing a little more on the belief part. What are we meant to believe? We are meant to believe in the God of your set man. When we say set man, in the case of Lofty Heights, that's Apostle Wally Tejumadi. 
I was very clear by saying, believe in the God in him. Paul said something very profound. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. How should we relate to those that God has set as leaders over us in church? First, we have to recognize the grace of the house, the grace upon the set man. If you've been here more than one month, there's no gain saying that the hand of God is upon the set man and is upon the leadership here. There's a grace upon the commission, lofty heights. And what is our focus? What is our aim as a church? That's to build who? Kingdom. I didn't hear you. Hallelujah. That is the commission of the house. To build kingdom influencers. Which kingdom are we influencing? Both the kingdom of God and the marketplace. Every time I've had to do a major exam, I always tell myself, I must get the best results. Somebody said to me, you're over ambitious. No, I'm not. The person who reads and gets the best, and the person who reads and just passed, they both read. So why don't I choose to be the one to get the best score? There's a grace of a corporate anointing. The fact that you're part of a body, part of a family such as this, there's a grace that is released. For those of you that didn't hear me earlier, I said something. I talked about the 100% uh, pass rate we've been having in this church. Look at this church. Look around. How many are we? And then we had 100% CPA pass rate, 100% graduation, three engineers. Look at our number. There is a grace in the house. And if you honor that grace, it will work for you. Amen. Amen. Things to note about grace. I hope we are writing. Grace flows. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, Grace flows. Grace flows. Hallelujah. It flows. Hallelujah. Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3. It's a very short psalm. Please, if you have it in the Amplified or NLC, can you give it to me? Grace flows. He said, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And then he says, What? It's like a precious oil of consecration poured on the head, coming down the beard. So that is how grace flows. It comes from the head, from the set man, and it flows to every member of that church. So the things that we see our apostle do, the, the dimensions in which he operates, if we have honor in our heart and we believe in him, we can actually manifest those things. Amen. It says, coming upon the edges of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body. So by virtue of the fact that you're submitted to a ministry, there is some consecration that comes. That's what God is trying to say in his word. Verse 3 says, it is like the dew of Mount Hermon, coming down on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. There is a blessing and there is the blessing. The blessing comes when you're under consecration. When the oil comes from above and goes all the way down. The second thing to note is that grace multiplies. Hallelujah to Jesus. Grace multiplies. Second Peter 1 verse 2. Still from Amplified. It says grace and peace. That special sense of spiritual well-being be multiplied to you in the true intimate knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace multiplies. When something is released, the belief is that as it's passed on, it gets less. That's not how grace works. As it's passed on, it multiplies. That's why the Bible talks about grace upon grace. The third thing I want us to know is that grace enables. Grace enables. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. 
2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, a very popular scripture. He said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough. Always available regardless of the situation. Hallelujah. You know one thing about God? God is the only person, the only being that can sort out a matter without hearing the problem. I'm going to say that again. God is the only being that can sort out a matter without waiting to hear what the problem was. That's one of the absolute things that makes him God. So his mercy, his grace is more than enough and is always available. So each time you sit under the ministry of the word of God, each time you sit under you know, the church to hear the word of God, to be part of a, um, a service, I want you to know that there's an enabling grace that is being received. Amen. Amen. 2022, I'll share this with you. Before we took possession of the ark in Regina, for those of you that don't know the ark, that's what we call the church, the building in Regina. And at that time where, of course, we had started, you know, discussions and all of that about the church, buying the church, but we didn't have enough money. I'm sure you've heard that story several times. I've hardly found a church who had all the money before buying a property. Hallelujah. And so at that time, Pastor called me and said, oh, um, he's ordered some chairs. And I needed to help to get storage somewhere where they'll be stored. Because the chairs were coming earlier than we planned to take possession of the ark. And I went around, tried to get something, eventually got one and all. And you know what the devil told me? The devil said, aren't you silly? Pastor is sending you on that kind of senseless. You can imagine you buying furniture before you get the house. How does that make sense? But you see, in the kingdom of God, things don't make sense. That's the beauty of it all. Scripture says, great is the mystery of godliness. So when it stops being a mystery, it stops being godliness. If you can figure out God's next move, that's not God. So the devil told me, he said, somebody sent you on that kind of errand that you too, with all your brain and all your intelligence, you're looking for storage for your chairs when you have not bought the house. What if they choose not to sell the house? But you see, by virtue of obedience, by virtue of submission to the house, I went ahead, did it diligently, and had that done. Now, this is the interesting thing. The following year, I was in the kitchen that afternoon. I've been trying to get a job. Uh, some of you may know what I do. My profession is regulated, very regulated here in Canada. And I was in the kitchen, and the Lord said to me, it's time to move from a step of faith to a leap of faith. Now, this is the difference, and I'll illustrate it. When you take a step of faith, you go like this. Okay, it's okay. You take a step. It's fine. You take a step. But let me tell you what a leap is. A leap means there is no plan B. You jump off here, and you land. If you sink, you sink. It was easy for me to take a leap. Move to Alberta when I didn't have the job. When I was not sure that we would ever get the job. We carried our load from Regina, drove eight hours and came to Calgary. This was August of that year. The interview for the job that I eventually got, I did it in November. You can see that that order is, sounds crazy. Normal people, normal, reasonable, intelligent people, they go for an interview, they get the job, and then they move. But guess what? MJ, she, she did not do hers like that. She moved, rented a house, paid for a one year lease, then did the interview, and then got the job. I had learned 
to obey the word of my set family. So it was easy for me to do something that crazy. When God shows you grass and you've been praying for cattle, that is enough for you to run. You don't need to see the cattle. If God shows you grass, who eats grass? Cattle. Once you see your grass, you know that your cattle is on the way. Hallelujah. Some of you, God has been showing you grass for two years, but you're still too afraid to move. Because you're thinking, what if the cattle does not come? It will come. The God of the grass is the God of the cattle. It will come. Hallelujah to Jesus. The fourth thing about grace, grace extends. Hallelujah to Jesus. Matthew 10 verse 41. Matthew 10 verse 41. It says, He who receives and welcomes a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous, honorable man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's resolve. Do you know what that means? It means that when your heart is open and you welcome God's servants through the words that are spoken up, upon your life, it says you receive a prophet's reward. If you read that scripture on face value, it's like it repeated itself. I don't know if you understand me. Let me read it again. He who receives and welcomes a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. You could have stopped there. But it went on to say what? He who receives a righteous man because he's a righteous man will receive a righteous man's result. And the Lord opened my eyes and he said something. He said, I'm talking about the benefits both spiritual and physical. Back when I was in med school many years ago, each time I'm talking with my pastor, we always had tests, tests, exams, and exams, and exams, you know, non-stop. And sometimes my pastor would just say something casually. There was a time I remember that discussion, he said to me, he said, oh, Jimmy, I think you should just focus on the things you were taught the last two weeks. I went into the exam hall, guess what? Oh, everything that I was taught the last two weeks was what came out. Interesting. That's the word of the prophet. The following um, exam we were to do, he just told me, oh, Jimmy, I think you should focus on those things that they emphasize during your tutorials. Because sometimes we have lectures, and then we have sub-group tutorials. I entered the exam hall, lo and behold, all the things that we, we did at the tutorial. And I was like, whoa, this man is anointed. The grace of God said, yeah, he's anointed, but I'm honoring your obedience. There's nothing you and I can do physically to make your set man, in quotes, more anointed. But there's something you can do to make the effect of the grace more pronounced in your life. And that is honor. That is honor. I've told you four things to know about grace. And I'm going to tell you the last thing before I move on. Grace can be without effect. First Corinthians 15 verse 10. Grace can be without effect. So in other words, he's anointed. There is grace in the house. But guess what? For some reason, it's not getting to you. Why? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Paul said so, he said, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not without effect. So in other words, there must be something to show that you're part of a local assembly. This morning you had a testimony of somebody who got a job. So why will you be sitting under that kind of grace You've been looking for a job, trying to change jobs, and it's not working. There's something more to do. Honor the grace of the house. Go into your closet and say, God, I had a testimony this morning. I want mine to be the next one to be shared. Hallelujah. Amen. Tell yourself that. And by the grace of God, there will be an effect. 
2 Kings 4, verse 29 to 31. 2 Kings 4, 29 to 31, the story of Elijah. Very popular scripture. Now, we'll just give a bit of a background before we delve into it. Now, this was Elisha. You know, there were two prophets, their names were similar. One was Elijah, the other was Elisha. And Elijah passed on the anointing to Elijah, Elisha, right? And Elisha received double portion. So the other was Elisha was Elijah times two. Permit me to use that. Now, the woman he had given a prophecy to had given birth to a son. And the child of prophecy had just died. And the woman came up to the prophet and cried to him. If you read from verse 29, very interesting. He said, he should take the mantle. So he gave him his um, rod. I said, go and lay it upon. He said, lay my staff on the face of the boy when you get to the house. And what happened? Verse 31. Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the boy's face. What happened? I want you to read it out. What happened? I can't hear you. After he laid the staff, uh, the staff on the child, he said, but... Hallelujah. So in other words, there was no response, no results. And I wondered, this is someone who had double Elijah's spirit. He gave an instruction. He's a man of God. Why did the staff not work? The following verse, Elijah had to come back and eventually do it himself. And what happened? The boy arose. So I kept wondering, why did the staff not work? He gave clear instructions. He said, as you're going, don't talk to anyone, don't greet anyone, go into the house, lay the staff on the child. And that was exactly what he did. But there were no results. It was until I came to 2 Kings 5. Please give me 2 Kings 5, verse 26 to 27, that I understood why it didn't work. Are you there? Hallelujah to Jesus. That tells us the story of what? Gehazi, the very same Gehazi. This showed you the kind of spirit he had. He had the spirit that was greedy, a spirit that was rebellious, a spirit that didn't agree with the spirit of the house. So for those of you that are not familiar with this story, Elijah had healed somebody, and the man brought offerings, and the prophet said no. Guess what Gehazi did? Gehazi went to block him at the back door, and collected everything, and came back as if nothing happened. And Elijah said to him, did not my spirit go with you when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money, garments, olives, orchards, vineyards, sheep oxygen, men servants, and maid servants? And the next verse tells us what happened. He said that the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave to you and your offspring forever. And Gehazi went from his presence a leper, white as snow. No wonder the staff did not work. So the problem was not with the man of God. The problem was not with the staff. The problem was with the person who used the staff. So when we hear from the pulpit the things that God has said through, uh, through God's servants, when we hear the declarations and it's not working, it's not because there's no power. It's because there's something we need to put in place. The heart of Gehazi was wrong. It will never work if your heart is wrong. Even if the man of God comes on stage and there's fire shooting out from his head, you will go home the same way you came. So grace can be without effect. Now, I want you to compare this narration with that of the kind of spirit Elisha had. 2 Kings 2, 2 Kings 2, 12 to 14. 
Hallelujah to Jesus. This was the narration of how Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And Elisha was there. He stayed there until he saw this. He said, Elijah saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel is horsemen. And he saw him no more. He was taken up to heaven. He said, And he took hold of his own clothes, tore them into pieces. Next verse. And he took also, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Take note of that word, fell. And went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now we have two stories we are talking about. Gehazi was given. True? He was given the staff. Go use it. What happened? Zero results. Here was somebody else that the man who what? Fell. So he did what? He picked it. He wasn't given. But see what happens in the next verse. It says, And he took the mantle that fell from Elijah and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they parted this way and that. And Elijah went over. So the waters divided. I want you to think about it logically. Somebody was given a staff. Go use it. He obeyed all the instructions, no results. Somebody else, mountain fell. He picked it up from the floor, went to the river and smote it. And what happened? Results. The difference between the person who has results and the one that does not is the state of the heart, not the state of the man of God, not the state of the church. And we need to understand that. If our hearts are right towards those that God has set above us, then we have results. Whether they give you or you pick it. So let me give you this illustration. The word is coming forth. And a declaration is made. This month of September 2024, somebody is going to buy a brand new house. Thank you for those of you who said amen. Now, it's possible that that word was a specific rhema to somebody. Brother A or Sister A. But guess what? Sister A is like, yeah, right. I don't even have a job. <laughs> this person is so funny. And then Sister B, who the word was not initially for, receives it with excitement and says amen. Which of those two do you think will get the house? This. That's just the way it works. That is just the way it works. Mark 6 from verse 4 to 5. Very interesting scripture. When I read this, I was very afraid. I was afraid of how powerful a man can be. Mark 6, 4 to 5. He says... And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, deference, reverence, except in his own country and among his relatives and in his own house. Next verse, please. And he was not able to do even one work of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sickly people and cured them. Did you take note of the word that was used there? He didn't say Jesus did not. He says he could not. There's something about dishonor. There's something about familiarity that can tie the hands of God. I call it the sin of familiarity. When I was back in Regina and I needed to purchase the vehicle, I spoke to Pastor about it. And at that time, my husband was not here. I didn't know much about buying cars. So, guess what? Pastor went with me to buy a car. Now, the fact that he did that. We went together, we made the purchase, we test, we did a test drive of that car together on the highway. You can imagine a few days later, I begin to see Pastor more as a mechanic than my pastor. That would be stupidity. We must beware of the sin of familiarity. Because of the kind of person we have as a pastor, especially. He just had a very free heart, very loving heart. That's just him. 
And many times, several of the leaders are just like that. Now, we must not say because we are so familiar with that grace, we don't respect or honor that grace. That would be a big, 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 big mistake. He says Jesus could not do this Jesus, Son of God, in person. And he could not, not would not, not didn't, could. Could talks about what? Ability. So you can freeze the power of God over your life by dishonoring your spiritual leaders. Hallelujah to Jesus. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. So when the restriction comes, when the flow of blessing is restricted, most times it's from the receiver and not the giver. I'll give you another example. Um, that same year, no, I think that was 2021 October, we had our festival of grace, like the one that's coming up. And at that time I was putting in my application for a job. Now, every province, you know how Canada can be sometimes, every province is like a country on its own. Because there are rules, what they want is different from the other. So I had made some applications to three provinces. And as soon as I submitted my application, within two hours of each other, I got two rejections back to back. One from BC, the other from Saskatchewan. Now, on the day that I got these rejections, that was the day, we were, it was a Wednesday. So we're going for recharge service. Those of you that don't know what recharge is, recharge is our weekly service on Wednesday. So we're going for a recharge, and I'd been told that there would be a panel discussion, and I was on the panel. So of course I was totally shattered, I was unhappy, I cried and cried and cried. So I cried into service. I didn't feel like coming to service. And I told God something, I said, God, I'm really feeling low. I want a word, a specific word from me. So we got into the program and we were, it was myself, Pete Edge, Lady T, Lady T is pastor's wife, and there was somebody else. And you know, you were talking to us about oh, how successful uh, Festival of Grace was and all. Now, between you and me, I was in no mood for that. <laughs> My heart had just been broken, so that was not what I needed. But, uh, you know, we powered through the whole discussion. And Pastor was like, okay, we are done, and uh, we're going to close. And I looked up, I said, God, what did your son say? <laughs> he said, we're going to close. I said, God, I've not heard my word. We cannot close that service until I hear my word. We got up, the chairs were taken off the podium. It was time to go down and see the grace. Pastor was on the staircase, and then he stopped. And he goes, there's a word for somebody here. I said, hey, that's what we're talking about. I will come to church and will not prophesy now. How? Because I belong and I'm invested in this, in the, I'm a stakeholder in Lofty Heights. So I cannot come to church and, even if you were not in the mood to prophesy, you will prophesy. I needed that word. I was at my wit's end. I had called my husband earlier to tell him I was coming back home because I was just frustrated. But that's how honor, expectation, that's what it can do, that's what it can draw out. I tell people when I come to church, the service is for me. I'm sorry, it's not personal. I can't come into God's house and I will not be blessed. It is impossible. Even if it is Zoe, this is Zoe here, lovely, charming girl. If she grabs the microphone, she will prophesy. Because I came. Because I came with honor in my heart that God, this vessel you've put before me, I will be blessed through this vessel. And I will. And that's the kind of heart we should have when we come to God's presence. When you honor the grace upon God's servant, things work less with less effort, less struggle. You just heard a testimony this morning and you're here looking for a job. I thought you'd start dancing already. 
Why? Because when God does something for your neighbor, it means God is in the neighborhood. God does something for somebody in your church, you should dance, sing, and rejoice even before your own comes. Because it will come. The grace that you despise, you can never get benefit from it. You can never benefit from it. Luke 4, verse 24 to 28. Luke 4, verse 24 to 28. We had the, um, in the Regina Church, they had the privilege of one of God's servants, I think that was last week Sunday, Pastor Shotubon. And you know, there was something he said that really, really resonated. It's this story that I'm about to share. Luke 4, 24 to 27. He says, this is Jesus speaking. He said, I assure you, I most solemnly say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But in truth, I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky closed up for three years and six months. And said, when a great famine came upon all the land, and yet Elijah was not sent to any one of them except the widow in Zarephath. And he goes on to say there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, but none of them were healed except Naaman the Syrian. We can also say that there are many people applying for jobs in lofty lands, but not everyone will get it except put your name there. It's not everyone that will get it. It's not everyone that will buy the house I just talked about. Meanwhile, if you're that person who wants the house, come, please come and share your testimonies. Amen. <laughs> Jesus did something and he said what? Is it not Jesus, the son of a carpenter? Is it not him? That's the sin of familiarity. They knew his father to be a carpenter. They knew what trade he was involved in. And because of that, they looked at him less as the son of God. I pray that we will not make that mistake in Jesus' name. It's not about the man or the woman or the child standing in front of you. It's about the grace you have chosen to honor. Like the woman with the issue of blood, she believed Jesus. And she did what? She inserted her name on Jesus' miracle schedule. By the time these protocol officers woke up that morning, she was not on, on the list. But she did what? The Bible says she came in the crowd. She pushed her way through. Because she said to who? Who did she say to? Herself. If I but touch the helm of his garment, I know I will be made. So it's not personal. You don't have to come to the man of God or whoever preaches and says, man of God, I believe you're a man of God. No. Sit where you are. Hear the words and say, Lord, this becomes my reality. That's all. She inserted herself into the miracle schedule. And by extension, she inserted herself in the history of the Bible. Because wherever the Bible goes, the story of her life is being told. So that's what you can do just by inserting yourself into the schedule of God. Now, ways to show honor to God's servant. When I say God's servant, the set man and every of your leaders. How do we show honor? One, pray for him or her. Pray for them. It's very dangerous to belong to a church that you do not pray for your pastor. It's extremely dangerous. Because as far as we're concerned, when you belong to a local assembly, you're submitting your spiritual nourishment to that assembly. And then you don't pray for them. So what happens? It means if they don't get fresh revelation, you don't grow. I don't know about you, but nobody is going to stand in my way of growing. Everything that God has prepared for me and mine, I plan to possess it. Amen. 
Ephesians 6 verse 19. Paul said something, he said, and pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation. This is Paul, the person that wrote almost half of the New Testament. So who should you not pray for? Please pray for your leaders. Pray, Lord, let the words they speak, let them resonate in my life. Let it work. None of their words will fall to me. That is the attitude of a church member. You pray, you pray, you pray. Number two, this is something very sensitive that some of us are not really aware of. We don't see it as a big deal, but it is. Do not backbite or raise an army of rebels. What you say in your pastor's absence is as important as what you say in his presence. Hallelujah, I'll say it again. What you say or do in his absence is as important as what you say or do in his presence. Let me give an illustration. Pastor is coming to preach, for example, and you're here on time. The day he's not preaching, you come late. Now, of course there are reasons, there are reasonable reasons for being late. But I'm not talking about you and you say, Pastor is the one, he's not even here. I will just casually go so they won't call me and say, where were you? Really? Whatever you do in his absence is as important as what you do in his presence. People should not be comfortable running down your pastor where you are. That's a slight to you, if you don't know that. So I, mean, I just kept my mouth shut. Oh, they shouldn't have the guts to run down your church where you are. I know believers say something about your church. When I say your church, I'm talking about church universal, church of God, and church local, lofty heights. And you're comfortable, you giggle. Really? No. No, 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 no. Rebellion is like a cancer. It starts very small and then it spreads till it consumes the host. First Samuel 15, verse 23. First Samuel 15, verse 23. It says, For rebellion is as serious as the sin of divination. NKJV says, For rebellion is as the, the sin of witchcraft. So a rebel is a witch. Even if you don't fly in a broom. That's what the word of God is saying. You don't need to have the broom. Just by being a rebel, the Bible terms that person a witch. He says, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Do you know what stubbornness means? Disobedience. There are some things your leader may not may tell you to do that won't make sense. Go to God and say, God. Even though it doesn't make sense, I will obey. Growing up, that's one of the things that God helped me to do with my parents. By, by, by God's grace, I came to know Christ before my parents did. So sometimes they tell me something, and with all the Holy Spirit in me, I'm saying, nah, nah, nah. That's, but guess what? Honor your father and mother. That's the word of God, right? Is there anybody here who chose your father? Show of hands. Okay, let's try the mother. You chose your mother. You applied that this person should be your mother. No. An absolute will of God is your parents. I always tell people, you can miss the will of God for anything. The one you can never miss is those that you gave birth to you. Because it was 100% out of your hands. So sometimes my mom will say something and I'm like, this thing does not make sense. But guess what? I go to God and say, God, it's not making sense. But guess what? She's my mom. Even if it was meant to go wrong, God will switch it because I obeyed. God will switch it because I obeyed. That's how important obedience is. It's a, such a big, 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 big deal. I'll give you this story. I don't like to share it, but I'll share it. Because I didn't like how it ended. But we learn, right? Amen. 
there was this brother and sister. Now, my, my home church, and even in Lofty Heights, when two people are in a relationship, we always admonish and encourage that you submit the relationship to church. There's a body, family life group, and you submit. Now, when they mean submit, not that they call you and say, you must not go to McDonald's, for example. I'm saying that on purpose out of this. No, it's not to control your life, it's to protect you. So, anyway, there was this brother and this sister. They were in a relationship and they were like, why should church do no? We're adults, we know what we can do. Fine. So, they were adults, church didn't know anything. And um, lo and behold, they, somehow the brother lost it and went with somebody else. You know, so they broke the sister's heart. And the next thing we get is a 911 call. SOS. This person did this, and everybody was confused. Like, sorry, sorry, what are we talking about? Oh, I saw him with this person, and the guy had actually gone to the other lady's home to meet the parents. You know, when you get to that point of meeting the parents, it's serious. And this sister got to hear about it, and she was about to flip. So the first question we asked is, why are you angry that he went to, you know, somebody's house to meet her parents? We went together. Oh, really? We didn't know. Now, here comes the shocking part. Because he had told her that they would keep it a secret, and he knew that, you know, she would go along with it. When he was going after the other lady, the other one was smarter than the first one. And said, you have to talk to at least my head of unit. So she took him to the head of unit. Innocent brother saw the two of them, prayed for them that their love would grow. So when the other lady came crying, wailing, it was quite funny. It was difficult to resolve. You were in a ritual, who knew? It was between us and God. Okay. It was between us and God. That's why the guy felt comfortable to go ahead. Of course, he was reprimanded at the end of the day, but her heart was broken. So when rules are made in church, Simple rules is not to put anyone in a box. It's not to, you know, intrude into your life. It's to protect you. That story was even better than the one that two churches in two different states in Nigeria. But those of you that are familiar with, you know, Nigeria, and one was in Ibadan, the other was in Ilori. He was cutting two sisters at the same time. He was working somewhere, so he comes home for a weekend. He married, listen, he married one of them, and she was pregnant. He was on his way to the engagement of the second one, the engagement ceremony, the engagement party of the second one, when he had an accident and died. It was now time to bury. What do you think happened? Drama. It was unpleasant, it was ugly. Now, let me tell you the most scariest part of the whole story. The two sisters he was caught in were from the same, like the way there's Lofty Heights in Regina and there's Lofty Heights in Calgary. So he had married the one in Regina and was coming for the engagement of the one in Calgary when he had the accident and died. You see how bold people can be? Unfortunately, he died. Now, the person we pity most is who? The one that was carrying his baby. The other sister, fortunately, they had not gotten married. They were about to. They had bought the wedding clothes. They had done all of that. So the person was, how? So when rules are made, most times, it's not because anyone wants to intrude into your life. It's to protect all the parties that are involved. Amen? May God give us the grace to submit to instructions and things that are laid, back, you know, laid down as guidelines in Jesus' name. Amen. Another way you can honor God's servants or your leaders is honoring them by giving. Give 
towards what touches their hearts. Sometimes we talk about projects, feeding the homeless, so many other things that we do as a church. When something touches the heart of your leader, it should touch your heart. So give to those projects. When we say give, time, attention, skill, and of course finances. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. So it means your attitude is as important as what you're giving. If someone walks up here and drops a thousand dollars, angry at everyone, taking a hard look at the pastor, and somebody else comes with a hundred dollars, with joy, God has accepted the one of hundred dollars first. So we must be willing to give. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13. I'll show you a scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, from verse 12 to 13. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, this is Paul writing, to appreciate those who diligently work among you, recognize, acknowledge, and respect your leaders who are in charge over you in the Lord and who give you instruction. He says that we ask that you appreciate them and hold them in the highest esteem in love because of their work on your behalf. Live in peace with one another. This is Paul. If it was not important, he won't put it in the Bible. So you communicate back. You treat them with care. You treat them with respect and honor. This is an encouragement from Paul to every one of us. And that's one way we can honor. Treat with honor. Give. Give advice. You have a skill, for example, and your leader needs that skill. Give that skill. It may not look spiritual, but you're obeying a biblical principle. As I was preparing and meditating for this message, the Lord said to me, He said, principles are like gravity. It doesn't care whether you're white, black, pink, purple, tall, short. If you walk over a cliff, you fall. It has nothing to do with your You can go off the cliff speaking in tongues, you still fall. That's how principles are. So this morning, if beyond anything, is just to tell you how you can honor God's servants in such a way that your own life gets better. Amen. I always tell people, if you belong to a local assembly and you don't give, I'm talking about even your substance now, then it means some things are not clear. You, you, there are some things you don't know. When you belong to a local assembly, you have submitted your spiritual growth, the nourishment of your soul to that assembly. And then you have your money and you say, I can't give to that assembly. Question, which should be more important, your soul or your money? Hello? I want an answer. Your soul and your money, which do you think is more valuable? Your soul. So it will never make sense to me. You feed from a church. You drink from a church. But when it comes to sowing seeds or giving, you can't give. Why? Because you're not sure whether pastor will spend your money on a holiday. You should be more worried that the condition of your soul is just not well fed much more than your money. So anywhere you can, anyone you can trust your soul to, you better trust your money with. It's just common sense. Hallelujah. Lastly, honor by serving. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 4 verse 2. First Corinthians 4 verse 2. It says, in this case, moreover, it is required as essential and demanded of 
stewards that one be found faithful and trustworthy. Serve in God's house. There is always somewhere you will fit into. If it's to come in earlier, help to set up. If it's to go home a little later, help to pull cool down. Whatever it is in your local assembly, please serve. That's one way you honor God's servant. The way you lift up and encourage your leaders is by being faithful. Hallelujah to Jesus. In conclusion, Matthew 8, 5 to 10. I'm not going to read it. You can write it down. When you get home, you can read it because of time. Matthew 8 from verse 5 to 10. This was the story of the centurion. He had a child, a servant that had a problem, had a terrible illness. And he went to Jesus. He said, Jesus, my servant, you know, needs healing. And Jesus said, I will come. And he said something. He said, you don't need to come. He said, speak the word. And Jesus marveled. Do you know what it takes to make God marvel? You know, Jesus was God on earth. And Jesus marveled and was like, wow. That's the weight of the words that come out of God's servant's mouth, your leaders. When somebody who's, who, whose God's hand is on tells you good morning, it's not a greeting, it's a prophecy. It's not until he stands and says, Oh, you child, this morning will be good, and everything you do will work. No, 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 no. That's theatrics. <laughs> when God's servant, somebody who's, who's hand, who, who God's hand is on, says good morning, that is a prophecy. It means your morning will be good. When my pastor says, oh, okay, good morning, I say amen. Oh, yeah. That's what honor in your heart can give. This honor limits your blessings. You just notice a person keeps coming, keeps coming, and yet nothing is changing in their life. Something is wrong. If I fetch from a stream and I use a vessel that is contaminated or dirty, I still can't drink the water. And it may have nothing to do with the stream. Can we rise to our feet? For many of us, this will be an unusual message. We are used to saying God will do it. He will. But that's if you believe. That's if you believe. Back to our first scripture. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Believe in God and believe in his prophets. That is God's word. I want us to shut our eyes for a moment and say, God, help me. Help me to know that if I can just honor the grace in the house, the grace will work for me. If I can honor the leadership of my local assembly, everything that is spoken will begin to manifest in my life. Lord, I receive grace. I receive grace to honor. I receive grace not to pay each service. Because your word says that it is important that a man be found faithful as a steward. And if any of us, by not knowing better, we dishonored the grace of the house, just ask God to forgive you. He's a loving father. Forgiveness is his thing. Just ask the Lord, forgive me. Help me to do better. Help me to honor the grace of the house. And as I honor it, this grace works for me in Jesus' name. Can you open up your mouth and begin to pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive grace to honor. Grace to honor. Grace to honor. Father, in the name of Jesus, that when we come, we know that we have come to you, O oh God, through a man. We have come to you, O oh God. We've come to experience you, Lord. Help us to be faithful. Help us, Lord God Almighty, that these words will not fall to the ground. What worked for A will work for me in the name of Jesus. As I look for a job, as I look for anything, an opportunity, an admission, whatever it is, Lord, 
I receive the grace of the house. And like I said earlier, when God has done it for your neighbor, it means God is in the neighborhood. Lord, for everything you're doing in lofty heights, I receive it because I'm in the neighborhood too. I receive manifestations of these things in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for new houses. Thank you, Father, for new jobs. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for beautiful relationships to your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. If you're under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that's where it all starts. You can't access grace if you're not even part of the family of God. I want us to shut our eyes, every eyes closed, every head bowed. If you're watching online, I want you to repeat this after me. Say it with faith in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I invite you into my heart. Save me, Lord, and make me new. In Jesus' name, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Master. From this day onwards, in Jesus' name, amen. Shall we celebrate those who have made this decision? Can we celebrate them? Please, if you're here, if you're under the sound of my voice, you made that decision either online or in person, send us a mail, and uh, we would like to follow up with you. We would like to continuous um, continuously encourage you in your work with God. Hallelujah to Jesus. At this time we're going to give our tithes and our offering. This is an opportunity to give to God. Tithe is 10% of your income. Many years ago <laughs> while I was in med school, my parents had just increased my allowance. You know when your pay is increased, your tithe also increases, right? So I was in church that day and I was thinking, oh, this one is looking plenty, the one I'm about to give. You know, and the Lord asked me a question. He said to me, He said, What if I asked for nine tenths, not one tenth? I quickly drop the money before He changes His mind. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's on the lighter notes. But you see, God's commandments are not grievous. He knows that if you give Him, what is due, you still have more than enough. Hallelujah to Jesus. Ways to give and display, you can give by cash, we have envelopes, interact. POS machine is right there, if you want to swipe your card, check and pay PayPal. Hallelujah to Jesus. These are ways to give. Hallelujah. Let's put together our tithes and our offerings. Scripture says that a liberal soul shall be made fat. So it means a giving soul would increase. Hallelujah to Jesus. We're going to start with the titles. If you're giving your title in the house, I want you to lift up your hand, your envelope, whatever means you're using to give just as a point of contact. Can we quickly have the um, titles confession? Please take it after me. One, two, three, go. Say, Abba, I thank you for your provisions and your love for me. I honor you today with my tithe. 10% of my income being given to you, not out of compulsion, but a response of my love for you and for the advancement of your kingdom here on earth. I can give a tithe because you gave the income in the first place. All that I am and all that I have belong to you. I declare that my tithe is not an expense, but a seed. This seed germinates, bears fruits, and multiplies. I receive easy flow of blessings, favor, abundance, ideas, wisdom, sound health, and things money cannot buy. I declare that I shall not beg or borrow but shall lend to many nations. My barn is always full, and my land, sorry, is ever fruitful and flourishing. This is the least I shall ever be in Jesus' name, amen. For those of us giving offerings, 
in our midst. I want you to also lift up your gadgets and say thank you. In lofty heights, we don't give out of compulsion or pressure. We give because we love the Lord. We give because He has given us in the first place. Can you say thank you, Father, for the privilege to give? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for receiving us and receiving our income in the name of Jesus. I want you to cast your seeds right now with faith in your heart, with joy in your heart. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. We've come to the end of another beautiful service. I trust that you've been refreshed. I trust that you've been instructed in righteousness. Shall we say thank you to the Lord? Shall we celebrate Him? Father, thank you. We give you praise. We give you praise. Today is our friends and family Sunday. So we have pizza and drinks for us to just relax, mingle, fellowship with each other. Amen. It's part of belonging. Amen. Please, if you're here and you do something, a particular job, or you have a particular skill, talk to people in the house. Sometimes somebody's looking for that skill, you have the skill, and they don't know. Amen. God may just be raising customers for you in our list. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Once again, I want you to reiterate the Festival of Grace coming up next month. If you want to go, please, I think it will be a good opportunity to visit Regina if you've never been there, to enjoy the fellowship in the ark. And God is, you know, sure to do us good. Amen. Time for our closing church. It's a church. I want you to say it like it's a church. Amen. One, two, three, we'll take it together. Blessed am I, for I walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, for my delight is in the word of the Lord. And in his word do I meditate day and night. I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I bring forth my fruit in my season. My leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever I do shall prosper. Go forth and have a prosperous week in Jesus' name. Expect the goodies of God, the goodies of God for you and yours in Jesus' name. I celebrate you. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. So please don't go home. Um, we have some light refreshments. Let's enjoy one another. Mingle, talk to each other. And um, please, sir and ma, this is your first time here. Is this your first time, ma? Okay, please shall we celebrate our dear, dear mom here. Thank you for coming. We are so glad to welcome you. I will see you for a few minutes if that's okay. And we'll just have a chat. Amen. Hallelujah. It's great to see everyone. Hallelujah. Be expectant. Amen.